You are watching Germantown Municipal Television, your source for everything Germantown. Hello and welcome to Law Talk on Germantown Municipal Television. My name is Vince Perryman. I am a local attorney with the Law Offices of J. Vincent Perryman. Each month, Law Talk focuses on a wide range of legal issues and topics. On today's show, we're discussing the Shelby County Circuit Court. With us now is Judge Valerie Smith of the Shelby County Circuit Court Division Three. Judge Smith, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having and, me. And uh, congratulations, you being the uh, newest judge we have in Shelby County. Thank you. Um, I think. Uh, in talking about the circuit court, a good place is, is most, most people in Shelby County, they know of 201 Poplar when they think of court, and they know court's not something they want to be a, yeah, a part of. But circuit court, uh, at least the division that you're in, is the civil side of it. And I think a good overview is just to start off with, you know, we've got several different civil courts in Shelby County, um, and I, you're, you're the expert on that, so I'll let you go. Well, you know, most people are familiar with 201 Poplar, whether through a joke or a traffic ticket or something like mm -hmm. that. That's where the criminal matters are heard. And sometimes, occasionally, a civil action, such as a nuisance action or something, mm -hmm. might be heard in criminal court, through environmental court or something. But what you hear lawyers around town say is across the street mm -hmm. in the courthouse known as 140 Adams, I call it the pretty courthouse. Uh -huh. um, it is the courthouse where all civil matters are heard. Um, in in um, the civil courthouse there are of course general sessions divisions, uh, one through six are, are there to handle uh, matters of uh, lower dollar amounts. Mm -hmm. And then the circuit court is present to hear not only appeals from general sessions and appeals from juvenile court, we also hear domestic matters and hear disputes involving dollar amounts. We hear those either through um, jury trials and sometimes through bench trials. And we are there to uh, hear those matters as they come before us. Mm -hmm. And how many divisions are there of circuit court? Circuit court in Shelby County has nine divisions of civil circuit court. Okay, and then the other, because uh, some people may say, well, isn't there another court? And there's Chancery, which has three parts, and well, and I guess there's probate that's got yes. two as well. Um, and probate is generally just going to be, that's my territory, so that's uh, dead people and uh, an occasional name change down there. Um, and then uh, Chancery has some overlapping jurisdiction, I think, with circuit, which I'm not even sure if I fully <laughs> understand that. So. Uh, there, there is an overlapping jurisdiction on several different matters, but the one that's most common to people are the domestic issues. Mm -hmm. When they are filed, they can be filed either in chancery or in circuit court. Okay. And then I, I think, now, can adoptions be done in either, or is that just, because uh, I, I think in Shelby County, we mainly do those when we file them in Chancery, but I, I don't, I, I think that that was just sort of an understanding between the divisions. I think that's just an understanding that, that they've had to, to do that that way. Okay, yeah. And, and it, it's one of those that we've got such a broad judiciary here, it's hard for any one practitioner or individual to know all the different nuances in all of that. Um, now, as far as, I, I think you've got a really interesting background as a judge because you started off on the criminal side, putting criminals away, and then you've done some other civil things after that. Well, actually, I started off as a, a law clerk in Circuit Court Division II. Oh. Uh, I started off as Judge Russell's law clerk, and then I went to work for Bill Gibbons as a prosecutor and stayed there until 2006 and handled all different kinds of cases. I tried everything from misdemeanor trespassing cases to murder cases. Mm -hmm. After In 2006, I went into private practice and have been in private practice for the past 10 years, trying cases all over West Tennessee. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think it's important for people, when you look at, when I go before a judge, I always like to know, you know, what's the history of them? What is their experience? Because it helps me also know as to, is this an issue that I need to really brief, just bullet point for bullet point? Um, or is this something where, you know, 
from their experience, they're comfortable with it. And I think that that's an important thing that in circuit court sometimes you deal with some quasi-criminal matters and it's refreshing to have somebody with that background to me um, because a lot of times those, those items aren't understood when we talk about criminal contempt or maybe an order of protection or something of that nature. Um, it, well, there, there are a lot of similarities between domestic work and criminal work. They are both facts driven and governed by statute. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of similarities. The orders of protection and I believe you're referring to criminal contempt mm -hmm. are obviously things that I'm familiar with having been a prosecutor and having dealt with those what, across the street at 201 Poplar. The procedure is basically the same. Mm -hmm. I mean they have some differences because of the forum that you're in. But the content is basically the same so that's certainly something that I'm familiar with and happy that I have that background to bring to this new position for me. Mm -hmm. Now, with uh, what, what are some of the routine type things that you all see in circuit court? Um, in, in circuit court, there are cases involving, say, a, a car accident or mm -hmm. domestic litigation, a, a divorce. Um, there are sometimes, you know, contract litigation. There are I issues that come up in in pretty much any. Forum. Mm -hmm. it, it could be absolutely anything. Uh, we have generally a, a large domestic docket and then there are the uh, say premises liability cases, personal injury cases and things of that nature. Yeah and, and for viewers that may not understand on the domestic litigation we're talking about divorce, child custody, sometimes after the divorce you've got issues as to are you paying the support, are you paying does somebody need to make a decision on education or health? And then when we talk about personal injury cases, that's where someone has been physically injured and they're trying to recoup their medical bills, pain and suffering, and those sorts of things. Yes. Um, and then I think you also said contractual disputes where you know somebody makes a purchase from someone or uh, enters into an agreement that's got certain terms in it, the enforcement of that. Yes. Um, and it's always, and it's one of those that I always try to make everything as simple as we possibly can so nobody's sitting there going, well, I've got this question after they watch this. Um, well, and, and just like in, in court, the more work someone does on the front end, mm -hmm. the less you have to argue about later. Yeah. And the I think the other important thing for a lot of folks to understand because they if they have an intersection with the civil court, a lot of times it's been general sessions, which isn't a court of record, and circuit is a court of record where uh, it's a lot more paper driven and, and pleading driven. Yes, uh, any appeal from general sessions court where there might be a collection action if you get behind on a bill and have some type of, of lawsuit over that, or if two parties have get into suing each other for whatever mm -hmm. reason, an appeal from that will come to circuit court. But there are, as you said, m there's more to it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the discovery process and there is more paper involved generally than is done as in general sessions court. Okay. When we return, we'll continue our discussion on Shelby County Circuit Court. Please stay with us. Check. One, two, one, two. Everything looks good on our end. And lights. Come alive with the forest. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. You are watching Germantown Municipal Television, your source for everything Germantown. Welcome back, I'm Vince Perryman and you're watching Law Talk. Joining us on our show is Shelby County Circuit Court Division III Judge Valerie Smith. We're discussing the Circuit Court. Judge Smith, before the break we were talking about how Circuit Court is a court of record and it's paper driven. So I think if we're going to, our whole purpose here is to arm the viewers when they go talk with an attorney about handling something for them. 
So how is the process initiated uh, with a civil action in circuit court? Well, we were talking about general sessions. In, in, mm -hmm. in general sessions, there is what's usually called a, a civil warrant, which is mm -hmm. one piece of paper which is filled out and filed and a party served. When you get to circuit court, while you could get out your legal pad and write something and title it complaint for damages and file it, it is generally much more detailed with mm -hmm. uh, you know, more specific facts and more specific laws that are alleged to have been broken mm -hmm. um, in a civil context in that document. So a, a, a complaint has to be filed followed by an answer by the other party and then I believe we talked about some of the paper mm -hmm. that comes about. A lot of that comes about through the discovery process which is something that lawyers use that doesn't make a lot of sense mm -hmm. to people that are not lawyers. You know, why, why would you need to discover anything that's, that you don't know about your lawsuit? Yeah. Uh, what I t always told my clients in private practice is that discovery is for a, an opposing attorney to find out everything that they might want to know. It may not be admissible, it may mm -hmm. not be something that can actually be used in court, but the attorney is entitled to know that and determine whether or not it can lead to admissible evidence. So there's a lot of paper that goes back and forth there. Uh, once that happens, and that can happen in, in so many different ways, I won't try to cover all mm -hmm. of them, uh, then there's often deposition testimony, which clients often, get, my clients in the past, often got confused with that being a trial whenever they knew that they had to come and give actual testimony. Mm -hmm. Giving deposition testimony, as you know, is an, another way that an attorney has the chance to find out what someone's going to say. Mm -hmm. There are not any surprises in civil court. In criminal court, there may very well be surprises. Mm -hmm. But in civil court, there are generally no surprises because the parties have had a lot of opportunities to go over the facts and figure out just what everybody's going to say before you would get to a trial. Yeah, and I, I will say it depends on the quality of attorney you have <laughs> as to whether they're surprises or not surprises. Because if, if sure. you, I, you know, I'm a frank person. If you've got somebody that's not doing their job and they're not filing the discovery to get that information and you go into trial blind, it's a trial by surprise, which makes it hard, I think, in your position, sitting there as the trier of fact, to determine what's going on between the parties if the attorneys haven't done discovery because I, what I think, and this is what I want my viewers to understand, is the most important part of discovery is if you've done the deposition, the discovery, you've locked the other side into a position and if they deviate from that while they're testifying, then that helps the trier of fact tremendously realize, wait a minute, these this puzzle is not adding up the way that this one side wants it. Well, all of those uh, you know, go into credibility questions mm -hmm. of, of whatever the witness may or may not be testifying to at the time versus what might have happened in the deposition. Uh, I guess maybe what I should have said is that the means are available for there not to be any surprises. Well, and sure. that is something that you know most attorneys that I've had the pleasure of working with are very thorough mm -hmm. and know that really know what's going to come about before they get to court. And, and I will say there's nothing worse than being in court and having the judge look at you from the bench uh, going, why, why have you not prepared <laughs> this? You know, because it makes it a hard day for everybody on that. It does certainly make it hard for everyone. You know, whenever Whenever people come in, we want them to get out as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. We want the courts to be open, access to justice for everyone to be easy and whenever things go on and for a long period of time it's often not the fault of, of the court it's often not the fault of the lawyers mm -hmm. it's you know sometimes things just happen but whenever everyone tries to move things along according to the rules and in a reasonable fashion then we get there quickly and can resolve whatever dispute is before me mm -hmm. yeah and I think that that's always a really important thing because you get clients they get frustrated with the judicial process because it takes time to do it right and then they you know it's it's one that it's stressful for the clients but it's also stressful for the attorneys and I would assume it's stressful for the judge because you're ultimately having to make decisions that y you've got basically one small window that you're looking through at the time you're spending that's what's in the record um, and I think that that's something that a lot of times we 
attorneys get frustrated, the clients get frustrated, and they don't understand that your job's got to be just as stressful as what we're doing. It is, and it's it's certainly different than being on the on one side and advocating for one side. Mm -hmm. To realize you have to listen to only what's before you and make a decision based only on those facts. Yeah, and then um, I guess the and if somebody doesn't like it, they've got the ability to take it to the court of appeals. Absolutely, appeals are available from circuit court, and those do go to the court of appeals. Mm -hmm. And um, so we we've talked about you know what a. Uh, typical case looks like on that. And I guess the one thing we didn't talk about though is, is the difference between the bench trial and a jury trial. Um, and some people may be curious as to how that works. Well, jury trials are, are generally what you see on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're watching Law and Order or something like that, you're going to see a jury. Uh, parties have the right to demand a jury for things to be heard. Um, whenever there is, say, a tort case or something, domestic matters, those involving the government are not heard before a jury. Those are matters who would, that would only be heard before a judge. So those are what lawyers refer to as a bench trial, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to a jury trial where 12 citizens make a decision and you know, fill out a verdict form, and the judge really doesn't have um, anything to do with that initial decision until the review process, if that comes into play. Okay. Yeah, and it, I mean, it, it's fascinating how, as a kid, I always like to choose your own adventure books, and sometimes court can be that same way depending on what gets filed and everything, um, and sorting through all that can, can be interesting on it. Um, as far as uh, the, in Tennessee, judges are elected, mm -hmm. and what is the general process of that? Well, in Tennessee, uh, trial judges are elected by general election. Mm -hmm. The appellate courts, uh, the Court of Appeals, Criminal Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court are elected by retention election. And there was actually an amendment passed, uh, you know, recently, which made that part of the Constitution that those levels of court are elected by retention, which is just no vote. Judges in Shelby County are elected by general election. Okay, yeah, and I think that that's also an important thing that we hear a lot of folks that they talk about when a presidential election comes up, oh, you need to vote or you need to do this. And I think that a lot of citizens, they don't understand that our judiciary, it's a good judiciary, and generally we've got good judges on the bench, but you've got to go vote to retain your judges. Yes. Um, and that that's always been you know, I, I always, when I have somebody complain to me about what the judge has done or whatever, I'm like, well, did you vote in the last election? Nine times out of ten? No, they didn't. Or they don't educate themselves as to who's on the judicial ballot, um, which I, I think that's an important point to make, and now we need to take a break. Uh, when we return from our break, we'll talk more with Judge Valerie Smith. Please stay with us. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund reading. No. <laughs> Let me try. Sarah's bright, but when she's reading, she has trouble sounding out words. Playing world music. What? I give up. Wait, I was trying to show you how Sarah feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. So, same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. You are watching Germantown Municipal Television, your source for everything Germantown. Welcome back. With us is Judge Valerie Smith. We're talking about Shelby County Circuit Court. Judge Smith, uh, I think we've covered, you know, what circuit court does and everything like that, and also that judges are elected officials. Um, and we touched a little bit on your background, uh, but I think viewers might be interested how you became a judge. 
Well, I recently became a judge. I was appointed by Governor Haslam mm -hmm. a short period ago. I went through, uh, well, when, when Judge Bailey, DeArmy Bailey passed away, that created a, a vacancy in circuit court. The way those are filled is there is a, a committee which you apply, it's a, mm -hmm. and it's not just an application like a, a short job application. It's a very, very lengthy application mm -hmm. um, which goes through your background and why why would you be interested in this position and what you might be able to bring to the bench. Mm -hmm. uh, we go through that, that interview process, uh, which is a panel of, uh, in my case it was uh, attorneys from across the state which are selected by Governor Haslam and from there three names were sent to the governor for interview. Mm -hmm. uh, there was then a two-part interview process with the governor's council and then 30 minutes with Governor Haslam. So I went to Nashville, interviewed, and then waited by the phone to see if I yeah. would in fact be <laughs> the person who was appointed and fortunately um, and very, very honored that he would uh, trust me with this position now, and I am the new circuit court judge in Division Three. Mm -hmm. And it just it, some people uh, may be wondering what what made you want to be a judge. Well, I've practiced across the state. Mm -hmm. I've practiced in absolutely every division of court in Shelby County, whether it be federal, bankruptcy, general sessions, criminal, civil, circuit, chancery. I've practiced everywhere. Having my background, having been a prosecutor and worked in, I did a lot of what we called criminally related civil work whenever I was in the DA's office. And then having tried cases across West Tennessee and frankly across the state, but primarily mm -hmm. in West Tennessee, I've seen what a difference a, ju a good judge can make both to lawyers and to litigants. And when there is a good judge present who's willing to put in hard work and continue to study, who respects absolutely everyone that comes before them, it knows when to exercise compassion and can remain a sense of who they are and remember what it is like to be mm -hmm. a lawyer, then it's a pleasure to practice in front of you. And I, I thought long and hard about it and I wanted to be that type of judge. Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, that that's the best statement I think I've ever heard of anyone say as to why they wanted to be a judge, uh, you know, and, and it's so true as far as it can be infuriating when you're before someone that they just, they, they, they haven't stayed up on the new laws and things of that nature. Well, when you have a judge who's willing to put in the time and the work and the effort and keep up, then it increases the access to justice for everyone. Mm -hmm. and, you know, litigants can get into court faster, lawyers can get done quicker. It costs less for mm -hmm. uh, clients to have to pay their counsel because they're not waiting in a courtroom mm -hmm. uh, for something to be heard or getting to court and realizing, oh, we can't hear that today. You know, of course things come up, but it, it's, it's better to, to try to work around everyone's schedule on the front end mm -hmm. and get things done in a more um, economic fashion if possible. Well, and it saves taxpayer money too. Absolutely. On that, but the, um, and, and you mentioned, you know, access to justice in there, which I know the Supreme Court's got a big initiative of making sure that everyone is starting to get access to justice. And we talk about pro se litigants, which are people that are representing themselves. What is, uh, I guess, I, I've always asked attorneys, you know, why does somebody need an attorney? But with pro se litigants trying to represent themselves in circuit court, what would be, you know, your advice to them? Well, obviously one has the right to represent themselves. However, if you come into court representing yourself, you're going to be held to the same rules and standards that an attorney would. And while I and all of the other circuit judges will be as polite as we possibly can to you, we cannot give you legal advice and cannot mm -hmm. tell you how to proceed. If you are in a position where you feel you should represent yourself, then I would encourage everyone to, who, who is in that position to visit the legal clinics, which are usually provided on Saturdays around town mm -hmm. um, through the Memphis Bar Association and through other organizations. There's often an attorney for the day program available in um, general sessions or, or simply call and see if there's not someone who's willing to talk to you. It's always, uh, and I've done it, I know you have, mm -hmm. I am always a little bit I don't know, warm and fuzzy maybe, <laughs> whenever, 
you see a pro se litigant in a courtroom and the answer's simple. Mm -hmm. There's, it's not something that's going to take a long time. And an attorney raises their hand and says, I, I'll talk to them outside. And it takes them out and, and sees if they, if they can't just resolve this matter quickly. Yeah, I, I, I recall one occasion in Collierville City Court where I just, I had to stand up and say, Your Honor, Judge Hall, can I, can I take this kid out in court? Let me talk to him and his dad. I, I think we've all done that, and it, it's something that's good for us to do. You know, we, we went through school and, and are able to do it, and it's, it's mm -hmm. always nice to have a good feeling of helping someone when they're, they just aren't quite sure what they're up to. And you can't always get them to listen, you know. <laughs> You can't, but it's and nice to offer. Oh, and, and that reminds me, because in that situation, the child had a traffic ticket. The mm -hmm. father wanted to be in there, but he just wasn't thinking. He showed up in a pair of shorts. So I think this is another good point to make some advice on what people should wear to court. Well, certainly, whenever you're coming into a courtroom, know that you're coming somewhere that's a, a long, long tradition of coming in, in in your best. You know, we don't wear wigs anymore. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I don't have to wear a white wig. But certainly dress respectfully. And I think that's all that any of the judges would ask for, is people show respect. You know, obviously don't wear a tank top and shorts and flip-flops. That's not going to go yeah. over well. Um, but, you know, generally what people wear is okay. Mm -hmm. But usually it's best to dress like you are going to a job interview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, it, it's always, it's one of those where we are in a very casual environment now in uh, just the way the world is and people, they don't think about it because they're like, well, this is, these are nice shorts, but it's like, no, you got to have your leg covered all the way um, and things like that. So. Well, I think, you know, when I started practicing, and it wasn't that long ago, but there was no announcement about turning off your cell phones mm -hmm. whenever court was called to order. And now there certainly is to prevent that disruption. Yeah, and, and it's important too, I think, any of the divisions you go to, stop outside the door, see if there happens to be any rules sitting out there and read them and follow them. That's always a good idea. So, and I, I thank you for your taking time out of your day to be with us. Um, our time is up for this edition of Law Talk. I'd like to thank our guests for taking time out of our busy schedule and being with us and sharing your thoughts and insights. If you'd like more information about Law Talk or any other program on Germantown Municipal Television, please refer to our website at www.gmtvonline.org. Thank you for joining us today, and be sure to join us next month for a discussion on legal topics, and don't forget to vote in October, or no, August. Um, until then, I'm Vince Perryman, and thank you for watching.